So in his on-screen comments, Professor Jack Goldsmith, he adopts a relatively optimistic view about the future. He notes that the Snowden revelations, whilst damaging, actually will act in the long term to create a more responsive and accountable government. He observes that national intelligence agencies on their own initiative have become more transparent and have, have revealed more openly the checks and balances under which they operate. To some extent, of course, as he mentions, they can never be completely transparent. That's the nature of the game. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a deep uh, recognition in these agencies that things have to change, that, there is, that it is time now to regain public trust. I think that the optimism of Professor uh, Goldsmith is slightly overstated. Whilst I agree with his views, I am not so sure that the future is, is as clear cut as he maintains. Throughout this course, I've covered both domestic law surveillance and international law in the context of cyber operations and cyber attacks. In respect of the domestic law aspect, which I covered in week three, I think that there are roughly three categories that Professor uh, Goldsmith's um, assessment uh, speaks to. Um, certainly three categories that I've encountered in my discussions with my colleagues and in my own uh, research. This is just a, a rough taxonomy of views. Um, they're not mutually exclusive, but I think they represent some broad divisions. One response in the context of surveillance and domestic law um, is, uh, sees this debate in terms of fundamental rights. Certainly I covered that to some extent in my uh, week three. Rights of privacy and liberty and freedom are perceived in fulsome terms whether or not they actually exist as a matter of law internationally or domestically. Any invasion of such rights through the passive collection of data, and especially uh, through metadata, uh, is resisted by people who hold these views. And uh, accordingly, rights of national security need to yield. To this end, the public trust that Professor Goldsmith speaks to, I think will be largely elusive. The capacity for states to undertake such surveillance, for national intelligence agencies to access such information, creates a chilling effect for some people um, in terms of personal creativity and freedom. Whilst rights of national security are not completely jettisoned, um, they are realised only through traditional law enforcement mechanisms where access to metadata is certainly not um, permitted. The second response takes a less doctrinal view and more of a pragmatic one, certainly in my reading. It is one that waits to be convinced that metadata actually does assist in national security. It does this through a cost-benefit analysis. Does metadata actually assist in countering threats? Is it metadata alone or is it in conjunction with other information? How does metadata actually enhance national security? We've heard on this course from Mr. Ren Gady, uh, who confirms that metadata does assist in the national security effort. You may recall that he spoke of the need to establish dots before one could connect them. In week three, I also quoted from a recent UK parliamentary uh, report that similarly confirmed that metadata has actually assisted in countering threats. The question from this perspective may be one of requiring more guarantees of accountability, of being able to actually trust government with information that is actually quite useful and explosive, hence the need for greater uh, trust. It's this fear of that, that this information may be malevolently used against uh, citizens, um, that is a, a gap that needs to be closed. This speaks of the need identified by Professor Goldsmith for intelligence agencies to be more transparent and to be more uh, accountable in terms of changing their culture uh, to earn this public trust. The third perspective that I've encountered at least is one that is more comfortable with metadata collection and analysis and perceives the new threats that originate by state and non-state actors to necessitate the utilisation of tools that can meet these threats. Public trust is largely established through legal controls to access on such data, which must be for public purposes and the continuing maintenance of safety. But even in this group, as Professor Goldsmith acknowledges, there is still a need for demonstrable cultural change to earn the ongoing public trust um, of citizens. It is instructive that in Australia recently, both major political parties agreed to pass laws uh, to retain metadata for a period of two years. 
Such non-partisan support speaks to the acute recognition by those in the political class as to the felt responsibility for national security. I think there is a deep sense, of, uh, deep sense that failure in this regard will result in harsh public judgment of the relevant government. This then leads to week five of my content. State and non-state actors are using cyber as a means and method of warfare and are conduct conducting cyber operations routinely. So recent and pronounced is this new phenomenon that groups of experts through the Tallinn manual process have needed to keep up with these trends and have endeavoured to apply existing law uh, and certainly legal principles to these emerging cyber activities. As we have heard Professor Schmidt outline uh, at length, there are gaps in the law in this field, or at least grey areas. According to Professor Schmidt and those that produced the, cyber, the, the, the Tallinn Manual, the cyber threat is real and is here. So in sum, this world is one dominated by secrecy, where asymmetric disadvantage can be overcome through cyber means. We have expectations on government, but many of us are also hesitant about the means in which government seeks to act in our name. Regaining public trust is a central goal in any liberal democracy. I like Professor Goldsmith's optimism about this challenge. I hope it can be realised.